All right, so this, is, uh, this class is entitled Sacred Families, Developing the Family According to God's Design. And this is lesson one in this uh, series. And the first lesson, of course, we start with the idea of what is biblical marriage. So under this uh, banner and title, uh, we're going to be looking at the spiritual formation of each part of the Christian family in order to create a home and a family that is truly sacred or set apart for God's glory and purpose in this world. A very high-minded, noble concept for the, for the family. Now I mention this because a family is truly sacred, that's why I called it sacred family, when it is purposefully and prayerfully set apart for God's use and purpose. And that doesn't happen by accident. If, if, if it just kind of happened you know, by accident, I wouldn't be teaching this course. But it doesn't happen by accident. It's, it's something that you have to plan for. It's something that you have to uh, work at. Uh, just like being saved. You know, being saved doesn't happen by accident. You have to do this with awareness and the intention of it happening. Nobody ever tripped and fell and woke up. Yeah, I love these movies. You know, somebody wakes up all of a sudden and they're like, where am I? Oh, I'm in heaven. How did I get here? Yeah, no, that's in the movies. You, know, you, don't, you don't get to heaven by accident. You get to heaven by hearing the gospel and obviously with an intention of obeying and believing. Well, it's the same thing with the dedication of a sacred family. It just doesn't happen. Just because you've been married 35 years doesn't mean you automatically have a sacred family. It's something you've got to work at purposefully. So the secular world places you know, a great emphasis on the importance of family, and rightly so, because it's the basic unit of society. You know, as the family goes, so goes society. But as Christians, there's an extra dynamic to family that we see and strive for that society ignores, doesn't even look at. We see family as an instrument of God's will in expanding His kingdom here on earth. As Christians, we see family as a type or as a preview, if you wish, of what Christ's relationship with the church will be in heaven. We're living out the preview of what our relationship will be with God in heaven. So when I talk about, quote, the family in this series, It'll not simply be about how to make families more functional or more peaceful, although we will talk about that. My goal is to reach beyond what we are or could be as families to what we are called to be as families. Not just well-balanced families, not just happy families, or even successful families, but sacred families set apart by God to fulfill His purpose in everyday life and reflect a measure of the glory that will ultimately be seen when the bride and the lamb are finally united forever in heaven. That's what family on earth is designed to be, a reflection of what the relationship will be with Christ and His church. So with these ideas in mind, we're going to explore three areas of family to see how we can develop a more sacred view and an experience of each. So this is the overview. First of all, we're going to look at marriage itself. The family rests on the initial relationship between a man and a woman. There are a lot of views and styles of marriage today, but we're going to look at the biblical pattern for marriage in Genesis, which contains the DNA, the DNA code for what marriage was meant to be by God. We're also going to examine the goal of every marital relationship and the goal for every marital relationship is to be in love for life. That's the goal. To be in love for life is the goal of every marital relationship. We're going to look at parenting. We'll actually spend several sessions talking about parenting. One lesson will be devoted to a look at how we can instill true spirituality into our children or grandchildren, and not just the knowledge and the fear of the law. A lot of us think, people who are people of faith think that teaching their children about God is all about don't do this and don't have sex before marriage and don't take drugs and be at church and 
you know, obey your parents. Well, you know, that's true, that's the law. <laughs> Those are rules, they're important. They're the framework, if you wish, of our spiritual lives, but they're not the essence of our spiritual life. That's not, we're not, we're not about rules. So we're going to look at how, how do we instill a sense of spirituality into our children? Not the same thing as making them memorize and obey rules. And then we're going to take time to review the very important lessons that God teaches all parents through their children. In other words, what do children teach us if we're willing to pay attention to what they're saying to us? And then we're going to look at the home. Final sessions in the series will deal with the overall view of the home. A home is not just where you live, it's where you live your life. And we'll examine seven different ways a home nourishes and molds a person's life and how a Christian home sustains and promotes a sacred family life. So let's begin with our series. We're going to talk about biblical marriage. And before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. We didn't start our series or our lesson this morning with prayer, just getting everything going here. So let's do that now, shall we? Father, we thank you so much for your kindness and your love towards us. We're grateful that you have placed us in the context of family in order to learn about you and to learn about uh, the future relationship that we will have with you in heaven. Please bless this time and bless each one participating this day. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's begin with uh, biblical marriage. Building a sacred family starts with a biblical marriage. In other words, a marriage based and put together according to God's original design. So there are three elements in this design found in Genesis 2, 18 to 25. And usually problems in marriage can be traced to these areas. In other words, when there's problems in marriage later on, you can, you can, you can trace back to some form of deficiency or you know, misunderstanding about this basic DNA model uh, that God has given us concerning marriage. So let's begin, shall we? There are three elements in the design, Genesis chapter two to the biblical marriage. The first element is knowledge of self. Let's read this, then the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So notice that Adam was taught about his environment and himself. He was an adult person in touch with his world and his own emotions and needs. And through his experience and knowledge, he recognized one important thing. He recognized that he was alone and he was incomplete in that alone state. Note that God did not create woman immediately. He gave Adam time to know himself and his surroundings and his sense of aloneness. Now I mention this because the basic teaching in the Bible about self-knowledge and marriage is echoed by marriage counselors today. Marriage counselors tell us that the best time to get married is when we have reached a certain ideal level of both social and emotional preparedness. Let me explain. Knowledge of self requires social readiness. You're socially ready for marriage when you have some idea of what you want in life and where you want to go in life. You're socially ready for marriage when you form, uh, uh, formulated some of your own convictions about things. You know what you believe, you know why you believe them. You're ready for marriage when you've learned to function within society independently. In other words, you may love and respect your parents, but you are now taking care of yourself by yourself. And obviously I'm looking at this group, you know, we don't have any pre-marrieds here, but you know, think back. Knowledge of self in preparation for marriage also requires emotional readiness. 
You're emotionally ready for marriage when you recognize your need for marriage. Remember I said, you know, Adam, he, he was alone. He recognized that there was no helper suitable for him. He realized, wait a minute, you know, I like giraffes and I like lions and I like you know, this and that, but they're not for me. They've not been designed for me. I, I'm alone. I'm the only one of me. And yet, God permitted him to have the experience of seeing two by two, you know, that why he created things two by two. So you're, emotional, uh, you're emotionally ready for marriage, you know, uh, when it's not something that your parents want for you, it's not something that your beloved wants, but it's what you want for yourself. In other words, you're emotionally ready for marriage when you're prepared to stop being alone. I'm happy, I'm good alone, but you know what? I'd rather be with someone else. And this is important because some people want to marry, but they continue to live and think as single people. I see that all the time. Marriage, you know, marriages have problems, why? Because one, one, one of the two or both of them are still thinking like they're single people. You're emotionally ready when you are ready to make a full and lifetime commitment. In other words, you're ready and you want to do it. If you have to be talked into it by your partner, if you have to succumb to the pressure of your family or your friends, you're not socially ready to be married. And you're not emotionally ready either. Now what often happens is that you have two people and four, four variables that don't match. For example, he's ready socially, but not emotionally. She's ready emotionally, but she's not ready socially. The match doesn't light because one or more of the variables are not in place. It snaps together properly when all four variables are working. The ideal situation is that both partners are socially and emotionally ready. So back to Genesis 2. We see that Adam was ready socially because he knew his position in the environment, in the creation. He knew what his role in life was and he was ready emotionally because he understood that he needed and wanted a partner to complete his life. And in his majesty and wisdom, what did God do? God created woman who was exquisitely made both socially and emotionally to perfectly complement Adam. So in God's plan for marriage, the partners know themselves, they know their position within God's creation, and they are also ready and willing to become, or rather to leave their single status to enter into the lifetime commitment of marriage. If you're not ready to stop being single, and you know we're always thinking single so I can date people, but it's not just that. It's single with you know, all the activities that you do as a single person. As a single person, you can get up and go wherever you want. I feel like just going out. You know, I, just, I think I'm just going to go out, call up Jimmy, we're going to see if we're going to have pizza at 11 o'clock at night and shoot the breeze. You know? Yeah, when you're single, when you're married, you, you don't have that independent uh, freedom, if you wish. A lot of people think, well, I'll be married, but I'll keep that. And then, they don't, they really, then, then the trouble starts. <laughs> and they're wondering, what's the problem? Another element in God's plan for marriage. So we said the elements that have to be in place for it. Knowledge of self. Number two, knowledge of our partner. Back to Genesis. So the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, I'm not sure about the idea of having one partner especially created for the other one. You know, I made a lot of movies like that, looking for your soul mate. There's only one soulmate for you. I'm not quite sure of that. I think, I think Adam and Eve were the only ones like this. And I realize that that can't be true, just one person, because I've known many people who have lost a mate for whatever purpose, but let's just say lost a mate through death. You know, the man or woman was widowed. For, 
and then some time passes and then they, they marry again. And they have a very happy, loving marriage. And it's not the same love that they had with their initial partner, but it's love, it's wonderful. So you know, I don't believe in this, only one person for, uh, you know, created for, um, for another one. I do know, however, that only one man was designed to be with one woman. That, pretty sure, okay? Not men with men or women with women, not three women and one man, no, no combinations like that. This being said, I know that the goal for the one man, one woman combination is that they become one and the only way to this goal is through knowledge of the person we intend to marry. Now, in every society, the road from being single to being married is different according to the culture and the times. There are prearranged marriages. We think, oh, that's only back in the Middle Ages or back you know, in the Old Testament. No, there's still prearranged marriages today in many countries. I met a brother in the church in Montreal, <coughs> excuse me, many years ago, who was, uh, he was uh, Indian. I mean, Indian from India, East India. And he was a young guy in his 20s and uh, just married. He had just one year, I think, he had been married. And we, he was a new Christian and we were studying together. And he was telling me that he only met his wife once when she was 13, when his family emigrated to Canada. And they corresponded back and forth, you know, but the families arranged their marriage. He only saw her once when she was 13, and then finally, when it was time to marry, this is uh, you know, in the 90s, uh, year 2000 actually. And he went back to India. He said there were 700 people at his wedding. <laughs> Seven, that's a lot of chicken. 700 people at his wedding. And they were married and, they, and I asked him about that. He says, well, you, you, know, you get to know each other. Slowly and tentatively, you know. They're still married, they have children, they look like an old married couple now. So that's still, I'm not saying that's the way you ought to do it, I'm just saying in some countries they still have prearranged marriages and those marriages work and are fulfilling and happy. There are also long courtships and engagements. I've known people who've been engaged for years before they get, before they get married. There are family introductions. Some people you know, got married because they were pen pals today, internet, through the internet. But in the end, the thing that we want to do is to get to know the other person so we can be close to them. My friend from India said that they, he spent a lot of time, they spent a lot of time corresponding to one another over the years. They kind of grew up together writing to each other. Why? Well, they got to know each other, what they thought, what was important. So this is an important part of the marriage sequence because it is through this process that we establish not only a marital contract, when I say a marital contract, I'm talking about a marriage license, vows, dowries in some countries, but it's during this process of gaining knowledge about the other person that we establish an emotional contract as well. We have a legal contract with our spouse, but we also have an emotional contract. The legal contract says you two are married, you know, it's binding by law, you know, property rights, succession rights, all that business, you know, that's the legal contract. But then you have the emotional contract, and the emotional contract says basically, you wouldn't do that to me, would you? That's what the emotional contract says. You, you would never treat me like that, would you? That, that's the emotional contract. And it's only two people who really know each other who can say things like that to one another. So two people who know their environment and who know themselves need to spend time learning to know each other. It's during this effort to know each other that the couple lays down the groundwork for their unity, for their, quote, oneness. Now the greatest problem here that confronts people in our society today is that we are bombarded with the notion that having sex is the only and best way to really know somebody else. Man, so much of it. I mean, it's overwhelming. 
The truth, however, is that engaging in sex before the commitment to marry usually hampers us in the effort to really know the other persons. You know, uh, if, well, I'm looking here and I'm saying many of you have children, even older children, grandchildren. Um, we're always telling you know, our children, well, you, know, you need to remain pure and no, no sex before marriage. And they say, why? And we say, well, because it's wrong. <laughs> it's a sin. Think back to when you were a teenager, how much weight that had with you. <laughs> the practical reason for you know, not having sex before marriage is that in, it inhibits you from really knowing the other person. And the big lie is if you do this, you will really get to know the other person. And it's completely the opposite. You see, sex was designed by God to do many things. To surrender self, I'm all yours. How does a man or a woman surrender self to the other? By cleaning up the dishes? By changing the oil on her car? I think intimate sexual contact is a much better way to say, I'm yours, I belong to you. God can, can, uh, created sex to confirm our commitment into our oneness. I am committing and I am committed to the us part, to express loyalty, I am yours. Uh, again, to surrender self, I am all yours. To establish family, to comfort emotionally. Sometimes, sometimes having sex takes the place of all the words that you can't find to say what you need to say to your partner. Yeah, God designed it for that, absolutely. And of course, to provide for physical pleasure, intimate enjoyment, for play. All of these things, God, and more, all of these things, God designed sex to satisfy and to, you know, to help express, all of these things. Now here's my point here. We're not usually ready to do all of this with, with someone that we don't know very well. <laughs> I don't know if I want to say, I, all of me belongs to you, to someone I just met three days ago. <laughs> so when we engage in sex before marriage, it usually is not much more than physical gratification that eventually becomes emotionally and spiritually confusing and painful. My point here is this, there are much better and less risky ways to get to know somebody. That's all I'm saying. Adam was ready socially and emotionally and God fashioned for him a perfectly matched partner. In the pre-sin world of the garden, Adam immediately recognized the suitability of God's final act of creation, Eve. He says it, whoa, this is it. You're, you're part of me, you belong to me. You're not a giraffe. <laughs> you're not one of those other things, those animal things. He knew her completely and she knew him the same way. These two were ready for the commitment because they knew each other in perfect wisdom and understanding as only ones who were without sin could know. We therefore should take special care in getting to know our prospective mates because unlike Adam and Eve, we're marrying weak and sinful. You know, Adam was with Eve. He was perfect without sin. She was perfect without sin. And they knew themselves and they knew each other. You know, all in the divine plan. But you and I, we're sinful, weak human beings and we end up marrying other weak, sinful human beings it would be wise to be cautious. It would help to get to know a little bit who it is that we're about to commit ourselves for life to. Knowing the strengths and weaknesses of the other enables us to go into a marriage commitment with our eyes wide open and that's what God wants. And I, I listen, I understand, I, I can hear you thinking 
I wish I knew that back then. Or I've said most of this stuff to my daughter, to my son, and they're not listening. Well, that's right. That's correct. You're in love, everything, you know, everything's moving so quickly. There's a chance that they're not listening, but you know what? Don't you want to be able to at least say the right thing? Don't you at least want to be able to present them with the right argument for doing what's right and avoiding what's wrong? Okay, another element in God's plan for marriage. Unity. Remember, we're talking about the elements of biblical marriage. Knowledge of self, knowledge of partner, unity. Genesis, Genesis 2, we'll read that in a minute. So we know ourselves, we know the other person, now we need to know what we're getting into when we get married. Marriage is a uniting of two people into a lifetime relationship that only death can legitimately end. Divorce can end it, but it ends it illegitimately. Death ends it legitimately. Now we know that marriage involves a ceremony and a legal contract, a personal promise or commitment, but these are the things that accompany and legitimize that sanction a marriage in society and in God's eyes. But in the end, when you say, I do, what you're saying is, I do promise to live with you as your spouse until I die. That's why living together is not marriage. I always have this debate with younger people. Why, we're, we're, we're living together, we're, it's as good as marriage. We don't need that piece of paper. And I always say to them, okay, what if you guys have an argument? Yeah, and you get, you get, you know, you get upset and uh, you decide, I'm walking out, I'm slamming the door, you know, can you do that? Sure. I says, how about if you're married and you're upset and you slam out and you walk out and you leave, can you just leave and depart? And they think about it and say, well, no. Why? Well, because we're married. Yeah, there is a difference. I like to point out that marriage is the highest commitment that one person can make with another person. It is the highest personal and social commitment that you can make on this earth. I say to them, it's not that because you live together, I'm not saying you don't love each other, of course you love each other, of course. And I'm not saying that you, know, you, you formed a home and that home is not a home. Yes, it is a home. And if you have children, I'm not saying that those children are not your children and you don't love them. You know, of course they are. All I'm saying is you have made a commitment to one another. Good. But you haven't made the highest commitment that you can possibly make. That's the point. And in order for a marriage to be a biblical marriage, God requires us to make the highest of commitments. And the highest of commitments socially that we can make between two people is a legal marriage. So all of this is high and noble, but very difficult for weak and sinful people to accomplish. So the Lord gives three small rules to follow in verses 24 and five to help cement the union for a lifetime. So let's read that passage. He said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So what's the first little rule here? Separation. You need to leave your parents if you are to cleave to your spouse. Cleave means to cling to or to be glued to. The commitment in marriage is to be glued to your partner, not your parents not your buddies, not your workmates, not your career. To your partner. When you decide to marry, the decision is to make your partner the priority over family, friends, hobbies, work, career, whatever. Because you cannot have unity without priority of the spouse. If you and your mom are closer than you and your, your husband, then you've got the order confused. If your career means more to you than your spouse, you've got those things in the wrong order. If your children come before your spouse, you've got that in the incorrect order. Uh, and I can get an amen here from our son, our eldest, in the class, 
I used to tell them, just remember one thing, I was here before you guys were here and I will be here after you guys are gone. By the way, when will that be? I was just, you know, as a father speaking. Yeah, Lee's has always been my first priority, always, over the ministry, over the kids. Over, I mean, those are other priorities. If you can't succeed in your marriage, especially if you're a minister, you know, you, you haven't got much to teach anybody else. Number two, the second little rule, permanence is permanent. You become one flesh. There's no room for any other flesh. In the one flesh, the couple doesn't necessarily think or act alike. One flesh means that both partners are absolutely committed to the union that they are both part of. This marriage that we share, you know, I'm all in. You don't give up identity, but you do give up independence. I'm no longer just me. From here on in, it's me and you. What I do involves me and you. Even if I go off by myself to go bowling or whatever, you know, it's still in consideration of me and you. My going out to go bowling or my going out to be with the girls shopping or whatever, that's me doing something on my own, but I have done that in consideration of the two of us. How does that work for you? Is that okay with you if I do this? Life has a lot of stages and marriage is designed to bring people together through each of life's marker points, both happy and sad. And then thirdly, intimacy. Intimacy must be without fear. The final verse says they were naked and unashamed. The word naked here does not simply mean without clothing. It means they were laid bare before each other. So Adam and Eve were totally honest, expressed their feelings openly, had no reservations about their sexuality because they were without sin and completely transparent with one another. God created sexual intimacy and placed it last, not first, on the foundation of first knowledge of self, the basic foundation. If you don't know yourself, how are you going to get to know somebody else? <laughs> how are you going to decide anything for the two of you? How are you going to proceed for the six of you if you, have, you start having a family, if you don't even know yourself? and then knowledge of the other. Why is that so important? Because remember what I said? First priority is my spouse. I got to know what she's thinking, what she likes, what she doesn't like, uh, what, what threatens her, what, what lifts her up. I've got to know that. Then the commitment to unity. This thing we have together, you and I, this marriage, I'm committed to this thing. And I say and do and act in ways that build up this thing of ours. And then sexual intimacy as the capstone. When these elements are placed in this particular order, then the marriage reflects the form that God intended marriage to be, and thus it becomes a biblical marriage. And marriages built in this way are pleasing to God and have a much greater opportunity to succeed. I realize for many of us this is like, wow, I wish I knew this back then, but it's okay. It's never too late to kind of shore up and firm up you know, whatever in this order here needs some strengthening, needs some discussion. And as we go on, you know, we'll talk about, remember, I, I don't know, not everybody was in class, but I talked uh, in this uh, series, we're going to talk about marriage for a couple of sessions, then we're going to talk about the family itself, you know, and raising children, and what ought to be our spiritual goals, and so on and so forth for children, and then we're going to talk about the home, how to create a home that, uh, that, uh, that enables spirituality and spiritual thinking for our children and for ourselves. So this first lesson we begin with marriage, and this is the basis. Next time, part two, we're going to talk about 
the goal of biblical marriage. This is the structure of biblical marriage. Next time, the goal of biblical marriage. Okay, that's it for now. Thank you very much for your attention.